I hate flying. I've always hated flying. From the first family vacation I took with my parents who insisted it was exciting and fun, I was absolutely terrified of it. And I have been ever since. I was hysterical on that first flight. Feeling such a huge, heavy thing just lifting off the ground felt so unnatural, and it still does. Not to mention the feeling I got when the plane banked to one side and all I could see were clouds on one side of us and the ground on another. Jesus, we were up so high. I still can't get over how tiny everything looks when you're taking off, and that just makes me imagine the feeling of a plane just stalling and plummeting back to earth. I'm pretty sure I really embarrassed my parents that day and I feel horrible about that, but my dad assured me it'd get easier with every flight, that eventually flying would be as mundane and boring as traveling by car. But it never did. It never got any easier. The only thing that got easier was suppressing how I felt about it. Like I can't take a window seat at all and if I'm assigned one I spend my time on the runway pretty much begging anyone who will listen to switch seats with me. I remember a time when I had a seat next to an emergency exit. You know the ones where the flight attendant has to ask if you're cool with having that level of responsibility. They didn't have to ask. I found her and pretty much told her straight up to move me. So in March of last year I had a relative die in a car accident. It was sudden, it sucked and the funeral was arranged pretty quickly. Thanks to work commitments I couldn't do my usual thing of taking the bus or the train across the country. I was forced to book a flight. It was that or skip the funeral and there was no way I was about to do that so I reluctantly pack a small bag, get a taxi to the airport and board the flight to Philly. I usually just booze it up in the terminal bars then continue to fortify myself on the flight. It always helps a little, just never quite enough you know, and it was on this flight back home that I experienced the worst turbulence of my entire life, the kind that started out kind of gentle. Just a little shaking on the plane while the fearful flyers like me gripped our armrests and prayed for it to end. But it got worse and worse and worse. The rougher it got, the more worried the passengers got and that feeling of dread. My god, I just soaked it up as the plane continued to shake. It got so bad that the flight attendants started to look worried and that's about the point that I felt myself having a full-on panic attack. It always kind of reassured me when there's turbulence, but the flight attendants look all chill like, this isn't anything, we get this all the time. But looking up and seeing the girls in those crisp uniforms looking terrified themselves? Jesus, that put the fear of God right into me. At one point the plane was shaking so bad that one particular flight attendant had to grab seats either side of the aisle just to make her way down the plane. Babies were wailing, people were literally crying and praying for God to keep us all safe. The whole time I'm just white knuckling it, downing the booze bottles I had set up in front of me and I'd be lying if I said I didn't say a few silent prayers myself, despite not being religious in the slightest. Then something happened that I'd never seen before or since. The plane hit some pocket of air so intense that it sent a jolt through the plane that was so heavy that it literally took the flight attendant off her feet. It threw her into the air and slammed her head off the top of the ceiling of the cabin. Passengers are screaming at this point as blood starts dripping off the poor girl's scalp and she tries and fails over and over to find her feet. People tried to help her from the seats leaning over and reaching out to her but she was visibly stunned by the impact to the point that she looked drunker than I must have been. I was convinced that plane was going down. I would never heard of or seen anything like that kind of turbulence and in a moment of horrible clarity I accepted that I was going to die. I pictured my relatives at the funeral, getting the double whamming news that one of our kin had died only for another to perish on a flight back home. And that was the worst part, considering the heartache they'd suffer, knowing that I'd settled in for the big sleep but they'd still be hurting even more so than they were before. But eventually the whole thing settled down gradually, and as cheesy as it sounds, by the time the pilot came over the intercom to tell us that they were looking free and clear until Philly, the cabin I was in broke out into applause. I don't know what happened to the flight attendants, I mean, I imagine she got medical treatment as soon as we touched down, but I remember looking down the aisle and seeing her head all banged up with blood having leaked down her face, mixing with the thick mascara she was wearing. Jesus, it really was like a scene from a horror movie. 
After another hour or so of flying, we touched down in Philly, and as we all departed the flight, pretty much every single passenger thanked the flight attendants for their professionalism and service. It was crazy how such an experience had created such a tight bond between all of us in such a relatively short space of time. I mean, some people were even hugging the flight attendants as they departed. Some had tears of relief in their eyes. Some were laughing and high-fiving each other, even making jokes about it being the most expensive roller coaster they'd ever been on, and how Six Flags was going to suck after this. I admit, I laughed hard at that last one. Not because it was particularly funny or true, but just as like a release of tension. I'm serious when I said I'd come to terms with my own death, how it was the most painful and soul-crushing feeling I'd ever felt, but I'd still come to terms with it. And I can't even describe the new lease on life coming out of that mood that it gave me. Even today, I'm still a slightly different person than I was when I got on that flight. I'm much more positive. I make the most of the free time I have. I live every single day to the utmost. But one thing hasn't changed about me. Something that will never change no matter what happens. I still hate flying. A few years back, I was taking part in a college exchange for six months, where myself and a Japanese student swapped places to get a taste of life in each country. It was honestly one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Japan is really weird by Western standards, but it's also full of some of the most wonderful, gracious people I'd ever met in my life. The way they think about life, even down to some minute details, is as fascinating as it is thoughtful, and going over there changed my life for the better. But something happened on the flight home from Japan, and although it didn't mar the experience entirely for me, it left a huge black stain on what should have been a very fond memory. The flight home was a long one, a really long one, like nine and a half hours followed by another ten hour flight. It's not easy being sat there in the same seat for that long at a time. I'm sure some of you know that, it feels claustrophobic, constrictive, and the fact that you can never really relax is just horrible. I suppose that's why people pop pills or plow through those mini liquor bottles just to gain some semblance of relaxation. So I'm in the middle of the second flight, eight to nine hour one that's going from Southern California to my hometown of Newark. I had worked my way through most of the in-flight movies and I'm sort of half watching this dumb sci-fi thing with Tom Cruise when I hear something over my headphones. I slide from off of my head to hear a woman, a few rows ahead of me, getting all panicky in a foreign language. I'm no expert, but I'm almost certain it was Chinese, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, she's clearly very frightened or upset about something, and keeps hammering on the little button above her head that someone's a flight attendant. A flight attendant comes by, trying to stay as calm as possible, but obviously can't understand what the woman is saying because of the language barrier. It takes a moment for the woman to find some medium of communication and I watch as the flight attendant kind of leans into the middle seats for a moment before jolting back up and rushing off down the aisle with this look of horror on her face. Moments later, she emerges calling out something that I'd only ever heard in movies up until that point. Is there a doctor on the plane? Are there any medical professionals on the flight? That's when I knew the situation was actually serious that it wasn't just some poor Asian lady having a panic attack or something. The look on the attendant's face had told me enough, but this just made everything concrete. Something terrible had happened in those middle seats. Eventually, the flight attendant emerges from the business class section of the plane with a professional-looking man in a polo shirt, white hair, and glasses. This was obviously an English-speaking doctor she managed to find. He does the same thing the flight attendant did at first, leans in to obviously give the person a brief examination before suddenly bursting into action. He looks around for the biggest, strongest men he can find, then doesn't so much ask them for help as tells them to help. I know that might come across as him being rude, but the authority with which he spoke, it was powerful. No one questioned him, they just got up to help, like it was their duty. People are amazing when it comes to an emergency like that. The bigger guys start working on lifting someone out of their seat, pulling them from the middle row and carrying them towards the back of the plane. I got a glimpse at the person as they passed. An elderly looking Asian man and he was as pale as a ghost, 
completely unresponsive by the looks of things too. I look back to see the doctor performing CPR on the guy after they laid him down, working on chest compressions, blowing it into his open mouth. That was distressing enough, but one of the big dudes starts saying things like, Come on, buddy. Come back to us. Open your eyes, man. You could hear the distress in his voice when it sank in that that guy was dead, that he had no pulse and was not coming back at all. Some of the passengers were crying, others praying. It was one of the most intense situations I'd ever been in in my entire life. So it's at this point that I look back to see the flight attendants had produced some kind of body bag from somewhere on the plane. I didn't even know they had those things on board. I mean, it was exactly the kind of thing you normally see in some Vietnam movie, this big plastic looking bag with a zipper running up the middle. The doctor and the bigger guys help put the man inside before zipping it up, while some of the flight attendants start reshuffling people for some reason. They move everyone behind me further up the plane, actually asking a few if they'd like impromptu business class and first class upgrades. But no one asks me, so in the end it's me with a row of window seats to myself, with two free rows behind me and then it's the back of the plane. I really should have seen it coming and asked the attendants to move me too, but the whole thing was so intense and everyone had so much to deal with that I decided it would be better to just not make a fuss. But like I said, when it dawned on me what was about to happen, I really wish I hadn't been so reasonable about the whole thing. Because suddenly, the guys are lifting the armrests on the second row behind me, leaning the seats back a little before hoisting the poor man's dead body up and lying it over the seats. I can't even describe how incredibly uneasy the whole thing made me. There was no smell. I mean, the body was fresh. But just the idea that maybe less than two or three meters behind me laid the body of a dead man. If it was impossible to relax before, it was now impossible to keep myself from feeling incredibly anxious. I tried to ignore it, but as you can imagine, that's just impossible. I found myself looking back between the seats every so often, just peering back at the shiny material and just knowing that that poor guy inside was just without a pulse. It was horrific. On the way off, a flight attendant took my name down and told me that I'd be entitled to money off of my next flight for being so incredibly nice and quiet about the whole thing, that it hardly ever happened and that they were so, so sorry that it had to be me that the body was sat nearest to. It was the least they could have done, but honestly, I don't feel like I want to ever fly again. Not for a long, long time to come. It is a slow night at the Sarasota Bradenton International Airport in Florida. The night team are used to quiet nights, but this one is particularly subdued, with not a single traveler walking the terminals or lounges. Staff manning baggage claims or rental car company desks are bored out of their minds, making small talk while they catch up on what little work there was to complete. It's a Thursday morning around 3 a.m. with it being the 19th of December, the place is abuzz with festive cheer, albeit slightly muted by the time of night. Staff will no doubt have been discussing holiday plans, looking forward to spending time with their families after being on such a grueling schedule of night shifts. But meanwhile, something is speeding towards them, something reckless that will put their lives in extreme danger. The staff manning the National Car Rental and Alamo Rental Car Company desks are completely unaware of what is about to happen. There are no warnings. They see nothing coming at them. There is only the faint rush of noise from outside the building to indicate anything is about to happen at all. They are completely unprepared to protect themselves from the impending danger. Then in one horrifying moment, a huge white General Motors pickup truck slams through the exterior wall of the terminal like a bullet from a gun, destroying the wall completely and sending a shower of wood and plastic debris into the interior of the building. It was traveling with such speed that the impact with the wall barely even slowed it down, and it continued to hurtle towards the rental car desks at terrifyingly high speeds, as the staff manning it jumped from their seats and rushed to safety. Luckily for them, their desk station was built incredibly sturdily and 
withstood the impact of the truck thanks to its hardiness and the slightly slowed speed of the truck, but there's no doubt that the lives of the staff manning it flashed before their eyes for a moment before the truck thankfully came to a complete stop. The truck, which had been traveling on Florida's nearby U.S. Highway 41, reportedly left the road and crashed through the airport's perimeter fence, then crossed part of the tarmac before plowing through a cinder block wall and entered the baggage claim area where it eventually stopped upon hitting the desk of a rental car service. Incredibly, only the driver was injured in the chaos. By some stroke of incredible fortune, no one was stood at the desk in hope of renting a car, as if they had been, there is no doubt that they'd be pinned between it and the truck, suffering horrific abdominal injuries in the process. We actually had a late flight, but no one else was here in the baggage claim area except a couple of workers, said Frederick J. Pachalo, and the president and CEO of the airport. If this happened during the day, it would have been a much different story. The driver, Juan Masivas, was later transported to hospital, but the crash caused major damage in the baggage claim area to conveyor belts, the ceiling, windows, doors, and the walls, totaling around $250,000 in damages. Prior to the airport crash, Mosivas was seen driving recklessly on U.S. Route 41, according to a Florida Highway Patrol release. The cause of the crash was unknown at the time, but incredibly, alcohol did not seem to be a factor, according to a press release from Florida Highway Patrol. But further research showed that Mr. Monsivas had been charged with a number of DUIs in the past, as well as for driving on a suspended or expired license. It's a miracle that no one was hurt, but that doesn't take away from the fact that, for a few moments, in the wee small hours of December 19th, absolute terror struck the airport's occupants. Stephen Sylvester and Pradeep Sangha were two men who were very familiar with airports and air travel. Each worked long days as taxi drivers, ferry travelers via the exact same routes to and from Heathrow Airport in London during the early 1980s. Whether the two men actually knew each other is unknown, but there is no doubt that they must have crossed paths at some point. However, there is no doubt that the two drivers have something in common, and not something that will have brought the pair closer together. Both men were murdered in separate attacks within six months of each other, each stabbed to death in cases that remain unsolved to this day. Here we will examine the facts of both incidents and see if we can't come to our own conclusions regarding their tragic, untimely deaths. Stephen Sylvester was 39 years old when he died and was working as a minicab driver for a company called Skyway Minicabs, which was located on Kingsley Road on Hounslow Underground Station just four miles from Heathrow Airport. Stephen tended to work the night shift, and in the wee small hours of the 17th of November 1983, he drove back to the company's offices after driving a passenger from the airport to nearby Feltham. Around 2.30 in the morning, a dispatcher and other drivers returned home to get some rest, leaving Stephen alone to work his shift. At some point over the next hour, Police reports state that Stephen will have left the office, presumably to pick up another fare. Whether or not he responded to an actual phone call or someone visited the office is unclear, but we do know that this is the last fare Stephen would take before he was murdered. I can only think of a few reasons why a taxi driver would get into the backseat of his own vehicle, but for whatever reason, that's exactly what Stephen did. And when he did... A bloody struggle ensued that ended with the driver being stabbed multiple times until the life left his body. His murderer then proceeded to pull his body from the back seat before placing it in the trunk of the car and driving to the airport and abandoning the vehicle in the short stay parking lot at Terminal 3 sometime around 4 o'clock that same morning. But at the time, only the ground floor of the short stay parking lot is accessible and is mostly used by night shift workers employed by the airport itself. Whether or not the killer was one of these employees or simply used it to escape justice by flying out of the country is another unknown in this case, but the fact of the matter remains that this was not a place to leave the vehicle and body if the killer wished it to be undiscovered. Regular checks are performed in this type of parking lot to ensure the right tickets and charges have been incurred. 
Drivers in violation of the parking rules are subjected to fines before the vehicle is quickly towed away. So it's clear that whoever murdered Stephen then placed his body somewhere it would be quickly discovered. He wanted people to know what he had done. Whoever Stephen's killer was, they would have certainly been soaked in the blood of their victim. Knife murders tend to be quiet and relatively discreet, but they are messy, and any potential witnesses would have certainly noticed bloodstained clothing, unless of course they were wearing all black clothes. There's a chance the killer could have visited a public toilet to wash the blood off, and using a disabled toilet would have given him all the time and privacy he needed, a terrifying thought that one could do so with near impunity. The police only began their search for Stephen four days after he initially went missing, obviously having to have waited for a missing persons report to have been filed by his employers or his relatives. But it didn't take long to find his vehicle and subsequently his blood-stained corpse, crammed cruelly into the trunk of his own taxicab. Police were baffled by the seemingly random and isolated murder, but that was only until it became apparent that the killer had struck again. Just half a year after the first murder, there was yet another slaying in the exact same area of London. The victim was a man named Pardeep Sangha, a South Asian driver who was employed by the company Blue Star Minicabs, located in Martindale Road, near Hanslow. Pardeep was an unselfish man, and actually helped supplement his father-in-law's income by driving his cab for a few hours during weekday evenings. Back in the 80s, most private hire taxis in the UK were not equipped with shortwave radios, so after completing each journey, they had no choice but to return to the company offices to wait for another fare. It was a Friday evening, the 30th of March, 1984. Pardeep Sangha had already been occupied with about a dozen fares that evening and had returned to the company offices to await additional calls. Around midnight, someone called the Blue Star offices from a payphone located close to some traffic lights on the Great West Road. This particular payphone was only a short walk from the office and it makes little sense that someone would waste the money calling when they could have simply made their way to the minicab company on foot. But what we know for certain is that the caller asked for a cab to drive them to Feltham, which, again, was not all that far from the offices themselves, maybe 20 minutes walk at the most. Around this same time, a man of large stature, who turned out to be a soldier as well as two young women, arrived at the offices, who coincidentally were also interested in catching a taxi to nearby Feltham. This, also with minor inconsistencies in the cab's company log sheet, confused police as to which fare Pardeep took first. Near to the payphone that made the initial call was a small wine bar known as the Boom Boom, as well as a South Asian restaurant called the Heathrow Tandoori, and it is entirely possible that whoever placed the call had been patronizing either one of those two businesses. But despite the close proximity and the number of potential witnesses in the area, not a single soul saw Pardeep arrive to pick up the passenger. What happened next is unclear. Neither the vehicle's supposed route nor the time frame made sense. But what we know is that Pardeep's vehicle was found completely abandoned and almost completely out of gas on a slip road just off of the A30, near to Heathrow Airport's southerly security fence. Someone had taken the keys from the ignition and attempted to wrench open the car's trunk, but had been unable to do so thanks to a mechanical failure. This all occurred most likely between the hours of 12.30 a.m. and 2 a.m. on Saturday the 31st of March, when a particularly busy stretch of highway that is frequented by very many lorries and trucks. Therefore, it is likely that someone, at some point, noticed the stranded vehicle and called it into the local police force. Then, just after 2 a.m., Pardeep Sangha was found slumped behind the passenger seat of his vehicle by police that arrived on scene. He had been stabbed to death in a frenzied, sustained attack that left his body with more than 30 individual stab wounds. They also observed that a few of Pradeep's credit cards were missing, along with a small amount of cash from his wallet. Pertaining to his last detail, it's entirely possible that the motive could have been a robbery gone wrong, but it's much more likely, given the murder had almost the exact same modus operandi as the Sylvester murder, and that the killer simply wished to mix up the details a little in order to throw potential investigators off of his scent. But regardless, the Metropolitan Police puzzled over the motives of the killer. 
Given that Stephen Sylvester was of Afro-Caribbean extraction and Pardeep Sangha was South Asian, could it be possible that the motive was racism? A slim possibility, but one to consider nonetheless. A police statement regarding the murders stated that they wished to question a man of larger stature in connection with the murders, but would not elaborate on why they wanted to do so. However, we know from further investigations that a replica of Fairbairn Sykes' commando dagger was deliberately left under the passenger seat of Stephen Sylvester's cab. Police quickly rolled out the possibility that this was Stephen's own knife, as it bore none of his fingerprints and such items are relatively rare, and often seen as purely collector's items. It appears the killer had deliberately left it there, possibly as some kind of calling card to clue investigators into his identity, or to throw them off the scent. Knives quickly became the factor that united both cases, and not just because they were the murder weapon of choice. In the case of Pradeep's murder, a U.S. Army trench knife commonly issued to U.S. Army Green Berets was found just over two miles away from the A-30 highway, hidden behind a GPO junction box. Police tested blood samples and quickly confirmed that this was the murder weapon used to take Pardeep's life. But there's another interesting fact surrounding the man's murder. You see, Pardeep was of the Sikh religion, and one of the pillars of the religion is the idea that men should always carry a small ceremonial knife known as a kirpan. This one in particular had a blue band around it, which was never discovered and evidently taken as some kind of trophy. As stated previously, both cases remain unsolved to this day, but there are a few questions and interesting details that, if explored, could shine light on the killer's identity, whereabouts, or true motives. For example, there were a bunch of small keys found in the rear of Stephen Sylvester's car, and the Met Police could not seem to fathom why they had been left there. When taken to a locksmith, the expert keycutter present was certain that they were for a clock, either to wind an old one, but... There was no doubt in my mind that if they had found the particular clock that these fit, that they'd have some kind of break in the case. Another key question would be just who exactly used the payphone to call in Pardeep that evening, the one so close to the cab office that it made very little sense for them to use it. Like I stated previously, the cab offices were just around the corner. The only reason I can think that that person didn't walk there would be to avoid being identified by potential witnesses as well as avoiding any CCTV cameras present on the way or in the offices themselves. However, in the aftermath of Pardeep's murder, a few truck drivers who were using the A-30 in the wee small hours of the 31st of March came forward with information. Witnesses told of a man standing near a vehicle with taxicab markings and was described as being in his late 30s to early 40s, wearing a gray two-piece suit with gray or sandy-colored hair. There's a possibility that he was merely a passerby, a man who had pulled over to simply offer to help someone in need. But if that was the case, where was his vehicle? No eyewitnesses reported an additional car parked up at the side of the road, so we can deduce conclusively that this man was indeed the passenger at the time, and if he was the passenger, he was also the man that murdered Pardeep and took his ceremonial knife as a trophy. It has been 37 years since Stephen Sylvester was murdered whilst working his night shift and police are no closer to uncovering the truth of his killing than they were back then. There are many, many uncertainties surrounding such a case, but one thing is terrifyingly uncertain, that a cold, calculated individual, who was psychopathically obsessed with knives, was able to plan and execute two murders and get away scot-free. In all likelihood, there is a man walking around London today going about his daily life who has fond memories of those two nights in 1983 and 1984 when he indulged in his murderous fantasies and made them a reality. There's every chance that every so often he opens up a small, locked cabinet hidden away in his home and takes out a small ceremonial Sikh dagger and feels the cold brass in his palm taking him all the way back to that night when he took Pardeep's life. And there's also a distinct possibility that the man takes an immense amount of pleasure in knowing that he's walking around with impunity, even given the fact that he took trophies, left clues, and was actually spotted by witnesses. For all intents and purposes, he outsmarted one of the oldest, most effective branches of law enforcement the world has ever known. He has taken his place alongside the likes of Jack the Ripper and Jill Dando's murderer, 
who were able to commit some of the worst crimes in history and remain completely undetected. We can only hope that the families of the slain can find peace in some manner, even when their relatives died in such grisly, mysterious ways. Morocco is one of the most beautiful places I'd ever been in my life. From the beaches to the deserts, from the forests to the ancient trading souks and bazaars, it's just a visually phenomenal place. I had no idea the place could even have forests, so if you were surprised to hear that, don't worry about it. Like I said, Morocco is mind-blowing. Only it's not just the sights that I found so memorable. The sounds of traditional instruments, of camels bellowing over the whipping of the riders, and the smells of Morocco are also burned in my memory. Spices, incense, sweet perfumes, but also less wholesome things, things like hashish. I'm not into smoking at all, really. I've always been really into keeping myself healthy, but I had some friends in uni who smoke, so I know what it smells like, and Morocco is full of the stuff. Anyway, at the end of our three-week trip, my girlfriend and I were typically late for the return flight. We're collectively so badly organized that I'm amazed we even managed to keep our heads screwed on. We're so late in our schedule that we had absolutely no chance of taking the advice of a fellow traveler that was given us the night before. It seemed a bit weird, but he insisted that we get off the bus halfway through, buy fresh tickets, and continue the rest of the journey. When I asked him why, he just sort of tapped his nose with his finger as if to say, that's for me to know and you to find out. He was a bit of a wanker, if I'm being honest. I'm not about to follow advice from someone like that who might have just been messing with us and as if I had the money or spare time to just buy us a pair of new tickets for no bloody reason at all. So we ignored his oh-so-sage advice and just got the bus that we had been planning on getting. The next morning we got on the bus from Chef Chawan, the last leg of our journey to the capital Rabat. It was a very long, very uncomfortable journey in the rickety old vehicle that looked like it had been on the road since the 50s or something, not to mention it was compounded by the fact that for the first time on the entire trip, I had managed to have eaten something that didn't agree with me. Needless to say, I was feeling pretty rough. When we finally got to the airport, we must have only had about an hour's to spare before our flight departed so we ended up hurrying through check-in and must have appeared visibly anxious to all the staff present, which is generally not a good idea when traveling internationally. We also had a lot of Moroccan currency to change back into British pounds, and I remember the cashier looking rather suspicious at the fact that we had so much and that we seemed to be in a big rush to leave the country. In a rush to leave, and in my case in a massive rush to find a bloody toilet so I could, you know... See to some personal business resulting from that dodgy lamb tagine I'd had the previous night. Of course, it was Saad's law that the blokes in security pulled us up to one side for a closer inspection of our luggage. It was just what we didn't need, so naturally it's how things unfolded. Just our luck. And after clearing out pretty much everything we'd packed, he decided he should summon another member of security to take a further look. I then made the near-fatal mistake of informing him that I really needed to visit a restroom while we waited, explaining in my terrible Arabic that I had an upset stomach, pointing dramatically to my belly and making strained faces. He asked me in broken English, like, Have you swallowed anything? And I take this to mean him asking if I'd taken any medicine for it, to which I nod and reply that I'd taken some stool hardener, but that they hadn't seemed to help in the least bit. It was only then that it dawned on me that we each had a completely different understanding of what the situation was. Somehow I'm guessing that he'd seen our bus tickets and he knew where he traveled from and starts explaining that Chef Chowan is a big hashish producing region and that I'd require further inspection before I'd be allowed to board our flight. My heart sank. He thought I was a drug smuggler. I mean, I wasn't worried about them finding anything, as I wasn't what they suspected me to be at all, but all the delay meant that we might miss our flight home, which would be a huge inconvenience at the time when we didn't need any of that at all. Not only that, but them not finding anything meant that the inspection might get very, very thorough if you catch my drift. 
I had previously been in physical danger of completely soiling my pants from the tagine, but now it was fear that became a clear and present danger to the integrity of my underwear. I tried to explain that I needed the loo, but by then, two armed police officers with sniffer dogs had appeared, and we were pretty much frog-marched into the corner of the security area while we waited, confident if a little nervous for them to check our bags. I was then escorted to an interview room where a Moroccan immigration official literally poked at my stomach whilst asking me a series of questions in perfect English about my drug consumption habits. He asked me if I knew that Chef Chowan was a big hashish producing region, and I told him that I knew it was made all over Morocco. He asked if I'd ever been offered any whilst in country, and I replied honestly that I had. Big mistake. He turned to his colleagues, smiled, and said something in Arabic which I almost was certain would have translated to, we got one. After a bit of talking among themselves, the immigration official tells me that I'd have to wait while they brought in a doctor to examine me. Once again I tried to explain that there had just been a horrible misunderstanding and that all I had was an upset stomach, nothing illegal on me at all. I begged for them to let me go to the toilet, but the more I did so, the more certain they seemed that they'd caught me out and that any toilet trip would inevitably be to hide the evidence. My girlfriend was in tears as we waited. The whole thing was grimmer than grim because the officials seemed to be taking a remarkable amount of pleasure in my suffering. I get that it's because they thought that they caught a smuggler and they probably get a commission or something for doing so, so I can't really blame them for that, but it just made the situation so much worse. Eventually, they announced that the doctor in question had arrived to examine me, but I didn't see any bloke in white and a stethoscope, only the original two security officials who had pulled us aside in the first place. It was horrifying. I asked if they had any medical credentials on them, but they just laughed and told me to follow them, and that if I resisted, I'd be detained in bloody Moroccan jail as a smuggler and charged with some trumped-up crime. Obviously, I had no choice but to follow them. I was led to a room deep inside some kind of detention center and was shocked by what I saw. It was something I'd never seen before, but laying eyes on the thing it made a lot of sense very suddenly, perhaps too much sense. It was basically a large, stainless steel toilet with no obvious method of flushing what was dumped into it. This was obviously where smugglers would evacuate whatever was inside them before immigration officials could sift through the waste for whatever contraband they suspected of being secreted. Then the English-speaking official told me in a very intimidating manner that he was going to find out if I was lying or not. I actually thanked him for finally letting me use the toilet. Call it Stockholm Syndrome or whatever, but I was feeling rough as a bear's butt by this point. But when I asked him if it was possible to get a little bit of privacy, his expression turned. He told me in no uncertain terms, as he took out a latex glove and pulled it over his hand, that it was either I force out whatever was inside of me, or he'd do it himself. I was absolutely horrified. This guy was massive. I mean, a real bear of a man, and his hands were huge. Trembling with fear, I just nodded. He pushed me inside the room with the special toilet inside, closed the door behind him, then motioned through the plexiglass window for me to do my business. It was then that I realized that I would have some manner of revenge on the man, that I was about to do something truly disgusting, and that he was now the one that had no choice but to suffer through it. I did as I was told, pulled my pants down, and began to fill the bowl with all that dodgy tagine that I'd consumed the previous night. There was a moment when I thought to ask him for some privacy again, but it slowly dawned on me that I no longer cared. If he wanted to hang around to realize the giant bloody mistake he'd made, that was his business. Besides, the pure relief that I'd felt to finally sit down on a toilet, well, that made what happened next so much bloody easier. I actually groaned with relief as an explosive, thundering poo fired out of my behind, my butt temporarily becoming an aerosol of feces and intestinal mucus. I found myself looking up at him through that plexiglass window with a smug smile that said, told you so, mate. Didn't I tell you? After a minute or so, he just shook his head, walked off, and let me to it. 
By the time I returned to my girlfriend, she was repacking our luggage, still shaken and uncertain as to what fate had awaited me in that airport detention center. She burst into tears again when she saw me, threw her arms around me while sobbing something along the lines of, let's just get out of here babe, I don't want to be here another minute. My sentiments exactly. In an instance of unusual fortune for people as disorganized as us, our flight ended up being delayed by a good few hours so we actually managed to get home without a hitch. But the whole experience taught me a lot. A whole lot. There are always just terrible cops wherever you are. Learning your rights is up there with remembering your passport, and always make sure you carry some emergency monetary notes in case you need to bribe somebody in a disabled toilet in an airport in order to save yourself from a whole world of embarrassment and stress. I don't fly anymore. I used to. A whole bunch, actually. It was a big part of my job to fly around the country to pitch investment prospects at meetings held for wealthy hedge fund managers. It was a cushy job. I mean, it paid far, far more than it was worth. But now I work from home and I drive everywhere. I'm talking everywhere. I live in New York City, but my parents live down in Florida since they retired, and yep, I drive down there to see them, three times a year sometimes. It's pretty terrible, but I'd rather drive all the way there and get the stomach flu from bad roadside tacos than fly, and now I'll tell you why. It was a regular flight from LaGuardia down to Houston, another business trip to finance flirt with oil-rich investors down in Texas. I was sat in a window seat in business class. Takeoff was perfectly normal, everything was peachy keen, nothing I hadn't done a hundred times before as I thumbed through the in-flight magazine and browsed the drinks menu. I had to get up at like 5.30 in order to make the flight and I've never been a morning person so as soon as I was able, I shut the window flap next to me, closed my eyes and tried to catch a few Z's so I'd be fresh as possible for the afternoon meeting. Then, just as I'm about to drift off, I hear a loud pop noise. In my weary state, I actually thought it was a champagne bottle being opened by some celebratory suit who was opting for the fizz breakfast. I look around and no one has a bottle, there's no attendant with an ice bucket, nothing like that. Then some horrible idea pops into my head, and in order to belay my seemingly irrational fears, I slide open to check on the plane's left wing engine. I remember expecting it to be fine. Nothing had ever happened on a flight before, even though I've had those little flashes of fear previously. But it was not fine. The popping sound had been exactly what I feared. There was smoke billowing from the engine, and thick stream of dark vapor that trailed along as we flew. I grabbed an attendant and silently pointed out the window, not wanting to raise too much of a panic. When she looked, she turned pale, then rushed up the aisle in the direction of the cockpit. Moments later, others were noticing what I'd seen, cries of panic sounding from all along the plane as more and more people noticed the danger we were in. People were rushing over to the left side of the plane, looking out the windows and screaming. All the while, the air hostesses aboard were trying everything they could to both keep calm as well as keeping the passengers calm. Right before the terror reached fever pitch, the pilot comes over the intercom. I think that was the weirdest, most surreal moment of my life when people were losing their freaking minds, but the captain was calm enough to the point of seeming almost bored. I suppose that's just the level of training they receive. The captain tells everyone to keep calm and to go back to their seats and that the plane will be making an emergency landing at the nearest airport, which by that point was an airport in Norfolk, Virginia. We actually landed just fine, and the only remotely bad thing to really happen that day was that I had to rearrange the investment meeting. But I swear to God, part of me thought that the plane was about to become a fireball as the engine exploded and we plummeted towards the earth at like 500 miles an hour. It was probably the most terrifying experience I've ever endured, and despite me trying to, I was never able to get on a plane ever again. So like I said, I drive everywhere now and as much as it sucks, it's better than getting the cold sweats and panic attacks from sitting on a runway somewhere, just waiting for the engines to go up in flames.
I work as an air traffic controller over at Sky Harbor International in Phoenix, Arizona. It's a career I dreamed of ever since I was a kid and my dad used to take me to the exact same airport I work at now to watch the planes roar over our car before landing on the runway. I wanted to be a pilot at first. Flying those things would have been the coolest thing ever, but I didn't have the 2020 vision required to be one. It was heartbreaking at first, but my dad, being the wonderful father that he was, reassured me that there was more than just one career for a plane obsessed kid like me. So, I worked hard in school, got into college, worked even harder there, then many years later, landed a job working my beloved aircraft as an air traffic controller. What I'm about to tell you is the story of an incident which occurred in July of 1997, when I was still relatively young and inexperienced. In order to make the tale more understandable to the layman, I will try to avoid as much technical aviation jargon as possible and keep the narrative clear and concise as to not bore the pants off of you all. But please understand, this is something neither myself nor my colleagues have ever been able to fully explain, so if it seems like there's a lot of holes in the story, that's because there are, for me, as well as for you. So I'm sitting in the air traffic control tower one night, fighting off the fatigue with cups of strong black coffee. I think I used to drink about seven or eight cups some nights, just one after the other on occasion when the tiredness began to really take hold. One of the things that majorly sucks about starting off in that particular profession is that you basically have no choice but to be on night shifts for months and months at a time. Since air traffic is generally slower at night, it gives new employees a chance to really get used to the whole routine of guiding an aircraft. That is until they're experienced and confident enough to take day shifts when things can get much more intense with holding patterns, basically a cue to land that happened to be about 20,000 feet up and multiple simultaneous landings. People's lives are at risk in a job like this, and it's kind of scary how much power is put into the hands of just individual men and women. Anyone who's seen the whole of Breaking Bad will know that we can cause or prevent the most wanton acts of destruction ever seen by human eyes, and I'm sure you won't be surprised when I tell you that we undergo regular fitness and psych evaluations to ensure that we're all at our best while performing our jobs. But anyway... One night I'm sitting there with my supervisor on break when I get a blip on the radar console in front of me. Usually when this happens you see the little blip pop up on your screen along with a little label that basically gives you the first flight number and thus all the information on where the aircraft has come from, its size and model, stuff like that. Only instead of saying AZ-104B, this thing has like XAX-000X001. That's not exactly how it is, but it will give you an idea of how unusual it was and how I immediately recognized that something was very different about this approaching aircraft. So I do my usual thing of tuning my radio set onto the frequency that I suspect the approaching aircraft will hear me on, then just about throw the headset off myself when this horrendous, high-pitched whine only a few pitches lower from making my ears bleed. I immediately tune out and ask one of my available colleagues if they are picking up that tinny sound on the same channel. They check, get the same thing, just about throwing their headset off with a yelp before telling me something must be up with the aircraft's communication system to try to talk over it and guide them in regardless. If we didn't, there might be an accident and in air traffic control, one or two little slip-ups could mean hundreds, maybe even thousands of deaths. So as a dumb trainee, I start doing as I'm told, running through the usual protocol and giving them their range and direction to the nearest available runway. Only there's absolutely nothing coming from the aircraft. In fact, the only thing that I can hear over the metallic screeching is a slight change in the pitch and tone of the whining noise, with the occasional metallic clicking sound being heard throughout the general din. That's about the time that I realize that whatever is out there in the sky isn't moving at a steady speed. It's moving and stopping, moving and stopping over and over again, or at least that's the picture I was building up from watching it on the radar. There are no aircraft that I was aware of at that time that was capable of doing that, and I found myself peering out of the tower in the direction it was, trying to catch a glimpse of the aircraft's lights. Only there were none. It was like there was nothing there at all, just empty sky where flashing lights should have been. 
Ours isn't the kind of profession you can just ask for help with either. With the skeleton crew that mans the towers at night, it's not like everyone else isn't busy with their own thing. I certainly couldn't ask the colleague I had previously, besides I was determined to prove myself as being worthy of such a position. Then something truly bizarre occurs. The aircraft starts moving laterally, as in, to the side. Either it was some kind of military fighter embarking on some kind of emergency maneuver, a helicopter, or something else entirely. And it does so at alarming speeds, like my closest estimation is that it moved at over a thousand miles per hour, which would have generated some kind of sonic boom. Only it didn't, which honestly is something that confuses me and scares me even today. The blip disappeared from the radar shortly after and I was forced to focus on another incoming aircraft that was as regularly labeled as any other. I didn't bring the incident up with anyone. I didn't want them to think that I was crazy or that the night shift was affecting me too much. I did file a report, however, but nothing came of it. It was simply filed away and forgotten about. But I've never forgotten about it and in all my years as an air traffic controller, it's something that's never been repeated. I'm not saying it was a UFO or anything like that, I don't believe in that sort of thing, never have, never will, but it is firmly filed under unexplained, and quite frankly, I'd do anything to find out exactly what it was, be it an advanced military craft, a radar glitch, or something else entirely. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story to submit, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord, interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data. Located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, do the crab dance. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-